Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for coming back from the virtual break. Um, we're on to our third session of the day in uh, track three. And uh, we're going to change up our format just a little bit. This is more of a fireside chat uh, with Sherry Stone and Tom Moran. And they're going to talk about fuel driver mutual assistance. So uh, Tom's been on with us all day. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just turn it over to Sherry and Tom and let them do some self introductions and get right into the discussion. Um, it's a perfect time to, to talk about this. I remember driving around North Carolina looking for fuel back in, back in May. Um, so that highlighted the complexities of the fuel supply chain and the critical nature of your industry for a lot of people. Over to you. Oh. I, I would like to open up, if, if I may, with a story about how I met Sherry. Um, I go to a lot of different exercises and, and the value of exercise, right? FEMA and DOE and DOT and so forth. Um, and about the best thing I can get out of those are the people that, that, you, know, that you meet, right? Because it's very complicated. It's very big. And so we were at um, Dominion Energy, had this beautiful brand new conference center. And it was, you know, round tables of 10. I don't know how many were there, Sherry. It was, it was a Wait, bunch of people ton of people, right? Um, and DOA went through the scenario and it was really good. And so I was trying to look around like who in here is like private sector, right? And private sector people kind of have this look about them when they're at a, a federal exercise. It's in, at, that, at that time, it was kind of like, uh, what's the best way to say that? There's a lot to absorb, right? Deer in a headlight that sometimes it, the scenarios are really big. And so at, at one of the breaks, I decided, you know, uh, just to introduce myself and, and Sherry and I met each other. And I said, so who are you with? And she goes, I'm with the, you know, at that time, at that time, the Fuel Trade Association, um, which has now become uh, Emergency uh, Energy Market Association. And so we struck up a conversation. We talked and the minute we got on, we, we talked afterwards. And the minute I started talking to Sherry, I knew right away that, she knew that sector and they knew her and I knew right away she was trying to solve problems for her, for her members, which I love, right? So she and I struck up a friendship that has really produced a lot of fruit, personally and professionally, right? We, we've, we've really enjoyed our relationship uh, as we've solved problems together, which is great. So um, for those of you that, uh, that uh, haven't met me yet, I'm Tom Moran. I serve as the executive director for the Ohio Consortium, and I came out of private sector. So I came out of telecom. My role there was to get industry and government to work together on communications issues, pretty much up and down the East Coast. Um, so I got drafted into the consortium when it was started by Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and that evolved over time into uh, kind of a, a, a cross-sector, multi-state, problem-solving entity. Um, and fuel is a big one. And Sherry and I spent a lot of time, I've been to her meetings, met a lot of her members, and just, just a really great person, not to mention a lot of fun, and knows the fuel sector like crazy. So I knew that um, we were going we were gonna to develop a good professional relationship and really solve some of these big issues and, and so forth. So Sherry, why don't you introduce yourself, your background a little bit, and then we got a couple questions, I'll just roll. Great. Thanks, Tom. And definitely, Tom, whenever I... Um mention you to anyone who doesn't already know you. I already always say Tom is an action oriented person. He's all about getting things solved and putting things together and helping with problems. And um, just love that about you. So I really appreciate being here. And yeah, I um, have spent the last 15 years working with what was the Petroleum Marketers Association of America. St Still the same association. We've just changed our name to the Energy Marketers Association of America. Um, petroleum marketers uh, transport, store, and sell petroleum products, including gasoline, diesel, kerosene, heating oil. And um, they, we are the primary conduits for bringing petroleum products from the terminals to the retail stations. And those same marketers um, own about 60,000 of the gas stations in the country. There's approximately 150,000 gas stations and we own about 60,000 of them and then sort of provide fuel to the vast majority of the, of the rest of that. So, um, and then we supply heating oil to about 8 million households. So that's, um, that's who we are. And um, 
we became, we've always been involved, obviously, in disaster response. We play a big role there. But after Superstorm Sandy in 2012, we became even more involved. And sometime after that is when we developed our program, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So that's my introduction. Very good. And, and, and Sherry, you've been on both the policy and the problem solving side. That's, in my experience, that's kind of rare, right? So you kind of have background in both work in the Hill and the issues there, as well right. as the problem solving, which, which makes you so effective, right? Because um, you get it, you, you, you got to translate the language, right? So, right. Um, so um, what, oh, over the past, I'd say, for me, and, and, and Sherry's going to give you a over the, over the past 15 years, um, fuel has always, always been an issue, but we, we, as a consortium, we never really had um, our arms around that, right? We focused on comms, we focused on electric, and then we got, we got to fuel. And it became very relevant during Sandy um, because that's when I started to learn about, okay, you can have fuel, but if you got no power, you got no fuel. Right. in a sense, right? And I started to wake up just my ignorance on the importance of fuel. And so how do you know, how do you know where there is fuel? How do you, you know, then you had to go through all these questions, right? And I think, Sherry, when you and I met, I, it was probably, I don't know, it was after some big storm and you and I met at that exercise, but then it started to occur to me that Sherry's members were the people who drive the fuel, right? Now they We're store it. Ground zero, yes. <laughs> they, st they store it and they sell it, but they drive it, right? And I thought to myself, so if I'm a driver, I make my living knowing who needs what I got and where to go to get more of what I got. <laughs> and I thought, exactly. this is the best kept secret. I mean, this is it, right? Um, and so the more I learned about it, the more I understood, you know, it's the fuel distributors, uh, and and and, the, and they're associated thing. They're the ones that really have the best um, angle on where the fuel is, right? And working with electric sector, I knew uh, that they never have enough linemen in any given footprint to ha to handle all the stuff. And so they build over time this mutual assistance thing, where crews come from Canada and you know Midwest and they to go to Florida for hurricane season or go to New York for you know Connecticut or whatever for winter storm. So there's very sophisticated mutual assistance uh, process that was uh, facilitated by the trade association. And so um, the background on the fuel issues were it was always like, where's their fuel? You know, a hurricane comes, where's the fuel? It was always the same questions over and over. And I thought, surely people know with this. And so um, from our perspective, it was always government industry wanting to know, okay, fuel's gone again. Here we go again. It's kind of a repetitive cycle. And where is that? And Sherry, from your perspective, um, from from your perspective on the when a disaster strikes, right? Uh, how how, are, how many times or how many ways are you asked? Where's the fuel? <laughs> where's the <laughs> common questions? Maybe share your thoughts about when it hits. What are you what are you pummeled with as far as questions and, and inquiries? Right, we're always pummeled with where can we get more fuel. Um, so at times uh, during a disaster, the, the problem can be a supply problem, but more often it's a distribution problem. And that's where we are. We're the distribution end of the chain. Um, and so when that happens, you know, our folks have to basically go further. If there's, for instance, if there's a hurricane and it, it hits a, an area um, and some of the terminals are down, there may even be refineries down, then our folks have to go, our drivers, our petroleum marketers and their drivers have to go further and further mm -hmm. out to get to terminals that are open, pick up fuel and then drive back. So it takes a lot longer. You know, you're going back and forth and everyone is, uh, you know, all, pretty much all the drivers in that area that are available are being utilized to do that. And so- Talk about, a ter what's a terminal? For those who don't know, when you say a fuel terminal, what does that look like? Where is that, right? So that's, um, it can be different locations. It can be part of a refinery or it can be separate from a refinery, um, but it's where drivers the, of the transport trucks, uh, the fuel transport trucks go to pick up fuel. Um, it's where they go to load the trucks. And it's not where the fuel is refined. It's just where they go to pick to, to load the trucks. And that's, that's it. So can that be like a maritime port? 
or it can be okay. yeah it can be at a port or it can be um you know of course on land um right. yeah so so yeah either yeah and and what are some of the delay if i'm driving a truck what are some of the delays that i face right mm -hmm. when i'm trying to get fuel right I, when i got an empty truck i got to go somewhere can you talk about what are some of the issues i'm facing now to get in to get the fuel to get out right so one thing you're facing are closed terminals closed refineries during a disaster um, some, you know, may have had some impact from the disaster and they're being repaired, um, or the access to, to the area is limited, you know, from maybe, uh, you know, road debris and so forth. Those things are usually resolved, you know, as quickly as possible, but it still may take a day or two, um, to get the, uh, the roads clear enough to get to that area. And then, so because of that, everyone, all the drivers are all going to the same terminals, you know, that are further away. So you have lines at those terminals that you normally wouldn't have that are longer, that can take hours and hours of just sitting and waiting. And if you're coming from somewhere very far, you may be going to a waterborne terminal that you're not, and you don't usually go to waterborne terminals. You usually only go to terminals that are on land. Um, in which case you need someone who has a transportation worker identification card because that's required for a waterborne terminal. Um, you need someone with that TWIT card to escort you through the waterborne terminal. And which case you have to have, um, you basically have to have an escort and, and sometimes terminals provide them, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do for maybe eight hours of the day, but not 24 seven. So it varies. So that's another thing that can slow people down. They can get to a terminal and find out, oh, this is, um, this is not really, this, this terminal doesn't have a, a, a TWIC escort available, so I need to go somewhere else after you've already waited in line, right? Right. Um, or, or you've already at least driven that distance. Maybe you find out right as soon as you get there, but you've still driven that extra distance. And, and so there, there's, 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 no, there's, no there's no way for me to know how long the line is until I get there, right? I'm not sure. Right. I mean, there's some communication among drivers, but there's not a terribly sophisticated system now. Um, the other thing is just going to a new terminal can slow the process because every terminal cards each driver um, how to use their specific terminal. Yes, you know how to, you know, you're, you have your hazmat endorsement, you know how to uh, load fuel, but you may not know the nuances of that specific terminal. So you have to um, take a little, you know, you have to take a test and, and be trained and have a test in order to have a card for that terminal to be able to just drive up and use it. So in the, in the instance of a disaster, what will usually happen is the terminal operators will provide people on site to the new people coming, the new drivers coming into those terminals. And again, they're coming in because that's all that's available for them to get fuel to the disaster area. So um, that can also cause a delay, it can cause a significant delay if it's not well organized. So, and, and, if, and if the communication hasn't been good between the terminals and the um, drivers, okay? So that's, that's just another, another thing that can slow people down. There are hours of service regulations that can also slow drivers um, if they've been on the road for too long. And, and that can easily happen during a disaster because you are, um, you know, you may be in line, like I said, you may be in line for six to eight hours. And so that's a, a good portion of the regular amount of hours that you can be on the road anyway. So fortunately, um, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is very good about trying to get out waivers ahead of disasters, which is also critical that it's before, like days before, because otherwise, um, you know, that's the time when, when everyone's trying to top off all the tanks. And it's also the time when consumers are coming in with every, every car they, and truck they own and a few containers as well to fill their fuel, um, which yeah. they don't necessarily need, but everybody just sort of panics. So that's just the reality of it. And so we, we try to, um, you know, we need to have as much access to fuel and so that the drivers can keep moving as much as possible in advance of say a hurricane so so let me get this right it, it's really the process it's not the fuel it's the process right that it can be the fuel it can be okay 
Okay, good it point. Can be supply. It can be supplied. Like, look at Colonial. The, uh, initially, that was a distribution problem, right. but it was soon becoming a supply problem. Or it okay. was a supply and, problem. And, and most of these trucks, if I understand it right, th these are not sleeper cabs. When you say a six or eight hour wait, you're talking right. men and women in their truck, right. two seater, right? Right. Most likely. Right. And God knows, how long, God knows how long they drove to get there to wait six to eight hours. Right. right. Exactly. Right. And and some do have sleeper cabs, but it doesn't matter because you can't sleep while you're waiting anyway, because, you know, you're still having to move, you know, anytime you're in a line, you're still having to move yeah, up a little yeah, bit, move right. up a little bit. Right. It's kind of like, it's kind of like an easy pass lane, right? Right. <laughs> exactly got, like that. Yes. You got three lanes open. You need about 12, right? Or whatever. Right. So, uh, that's great. Um, and, and, okay. And so I, I just, I didn't fully grasp the, from the driver perspective, uh, the issues they face, not just time and, and process and do I have a quick car, a quick card or not? Oh, that's, where do I go? Uh, I also didn't understand some of the other things these folks are, are, are burdened with, uh, just liability is unbelievable. Uh, I went to your, I went to your, um, I forget where you had your function that I went to. Um, yes, thank you. And I had a chance to talk to a lot of the folks and um, I asked them, I said, what's the single biggest problem you all face? He goes, Tom, it's liability. I said, what do you mean? And he told me this story. I think he told us from stage that one of his, one of, one of their drivers delivered, you know, delivered fuel to a station, you know, did, did all their stuff. They pulled away and drove off and some individual came on a motorcycle was filling up, left whatever up in a fire, boom, an explosion, you know, uh, people got hurt. And um, in the end, it was the driver of the fuel truck got paid for that. Right. I was like, and are you? That's the biggest <laughs> problem for the insurance companies. It may not be necessarily, I mean, it is a huge problem all around, but it's especially for the insurance companies. I think that was that was an insurance company. I, I had no idea. And, and of course, then I was curious about that issue because that, I mean, that's just another that's just one other chit in the exactly. bucket that you guys right. face. I have no idea of the liability they that they face. So they're 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 on high alert to make sure everything's done right, done by the book, and check Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Oh and, my and, gosh. And, yes. and even though they do it by the book, it sometimes it still doesn't matter. It's weird. Somebody can do something weird and unexpected, yeah. and, and you yeah. So, have a <laughs> so so here I so here I'm just sucking all this in, right? It's amazing. So Sherry, what drove you know, I watched it. I watched the mutual assistance network work really well in the electric sector. And I just assume every sector did that. They didn't. The telecom space used to do that. And then, you know, wireless came in and the whole thing kind of deregulation. It just kind of went. Now it's very competitive. Right. Unfortunately, uh, in the telecom space, it's getting better. But what what kind of drove your thinking towards, you know, we need to do something where we can leverage our members to work together, maybe to crowdsource fuel delivery or something like that. What, what was what drove that need, if you will? Well, I think um, petroleum marketers are, are so much like, you know, the person that lives next door to you. They, they're just good people, hardworking, and they have always come to each other's aid. But what has happened is. Um, I think it started, especially like you said before, with Sandy, Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Um, we saw like just such a huge impact. And in that case, especially because that area was not accustomed to like really big storms like that, at least not very often, um, or big disasters like that. So what happened is it, we just started seeing more and more of these big disasters and, and there just weren't enough local or nearby marketers to handle um, the excess, right? So we realized, okay, we need a system where we, where someone can contact us and say, hey, look, we need, um, we need fuel that we don't normally need, um, you know, we don't have a contract for. Can you get us in touch with somebody who would be willing to drive here from, you know, somewhere beyond this disaster area to get us fuel? And that's where our new program, the um, EMA Disaster Fuel Response Program came in and has been very helpful. Basically, it's just a current list of marketers who are willing to provide fuel during a disaster and who will drive you know, longer distances than usual to do so. They go into different areas again, like the TWIC, the whole TWIC issue and the, and the card issue. But, 
um, that just made all the difference. And, and we've seen it, it's been utilized quite a bit uh, in the past. It's more and more every year people are using it. Um, I know Tom that All Hazards Consortium has, has gotten information out to folks about it and it's been helpful. Uh, with Hurricane Ida, we basically were fully activated with that program but um, that wasn't actually even enough during Ida because it was the, the need was so strong in Louisiana. So in that case, we went back and actually reached out to all of our state association executives because we are, we are EMA as a federation of the state associations. We reached out to them and said, look, we need volunteers, you know, marketers who can just bring, who can bring any fuel they can. If it's just one load of fuel, that's going to make a huge difference. Just volunteers to do that. And fortunately, um, Natalie Isaacs with the uh, Louisiana Association was able on that end to link people um, to, to you know, the state, the governor's office um, and uh, make that connection so that everyone said so that that could happen. And we ended up with about 250 trucks from about 16 different states in Louisiana in response to Hurricane Ida. Mm -hmm. And so that was when we, that was the first time we've ever needed to extend even beyond our disaster fuel response program. So. And when you say people need to know primarily state and local government or is, are the users of that or is commercial or both? It's How mostly commercial, but, but during a disaster like that, like Jim Williams in, in uh, Louisiana, he did such a phenomenal job of um, just on every level of trying to, to provide support and, solve problems and solve problems and solve problems and he right, right. oh you know Jim and he he basically um he and, and Natalie and I were able to figure out where the fuel was needed because we didn't have it with the program we have a system where a company contacts someone on the list right and they that's all between them and we do not get involved um mm -hmm. but in this instance we needed to link people were coming to EMA and saying, hey, look, we're willing to do this. Um, just get us, you know, tell us who to go to. We can't make that decision as a trade association. It's an antitrust issue. But what we can do is, is pa pa pass that name on to, um, to the state and, and to uh, the state association, and they can help match with people who are looking for fuel. And that's what they Perfect. did. Yeah. I see. So you, you just became kind of again to connecting the need with the yes. supply. Yes, exactly. Wow. Yeah. And you're saying during Ida, there was how many, how many trucks and, and estimate was there a number, like a gallon, how many gallons came in, anything mm -hmm. like that? Be curious. I, I really don't have an estimate on gallons, but mm -hmm. 250 trucks and you know, yeah. upwards to 8,000 gallons. So it could be quite a lot. You're saying um, each truck's about 10,000 gallons, right? It can be up to 80. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now I, 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 I think it's great. And having met your members, I, I couldn't underscore more about that was a community. I mean, they had their wives, kids. I mean, you could tell this was a tight knit group. It was really great. I felt like family. I, mean, yeah. I, was an outs I was an outsider. I felt like very comfortable, you know, <laughs> and it, was, it was just great. And I thought, wow, we didn't help these people. Right. Uh, and so Sherry and I talked about, you know, getting that organized, getting a list together, uh, getting the word out. Um, we're not, I, I think we're just finishing rev one, right? I think, I think there's more to come I think uh, so, on that. Yeah. 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 And um, where do you see, where do you kind of see this evolving over the next couple, three, four years uh, from your perspective? And, you know, there's yeah. no guarantees. Where, where do you, where would you like to see that go? I'd like to see more and more of our members signing up for the program. We have, a, we have a tremendous amount, but, but with 8,000 marketers out there, um, we could have even more. Um, so I think that will happen. And I'd especially like to see more of the states coming to us during a disaster and saying, can you help? I know when Louisiana did that, they were very glad they did. And um, it, again, it was able to make the difference that they needed. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a great, I think it's a great program and it can work anywhere, any region really. I mean, they, they all have fuel issues just at different times in different ways, right? <laughs> it's just kind of, right, right. Different right? disasters. Yeah. yeah, but the longer I'm in my 18th year, Sherry, the more I, the more I work this 
crisis management, it's like water, power, fuel, right? Food. Food. And, and comms, right? If you don't, have, oh, right. I don't my cell, you don't have my cell phone, oh my God, it's an emergency, you know, that kind of thing, right? But you can't live without water. And right behind that is fuel. And people don't, people don't, are you're not used to that, right? I know when uh, the Colonial Pipeline hit, I'm in Maryland and I, and I, I saw reports of, there was one thing on a television at a Costco, and I won't say this person uh, bought plastic storage containers with just snap on lids. I mean, big ones, right? And he's filling them up with gas. Yeah. <laughs> and two of them. You started immediately <laughs> leaking too. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, at first I was, I gotta confess, I was kind of like judgmental, but then I thought about it. I said, well, that's, that's fear, right? Mm -hmm. If yeah. you can't go to work, you know, or there's an emergency or you're a nurse or what, you, you just, fear is a crazy thing. Um, and, and I often wonder, maybe one of the use cases we look at is how to help media and government work together so we don't cause these panics, you know, because of a, a picture on television or some report that we haven't verified yet, uh, because it does, it does cause a big issue. And I know you guys are working that. Um, and I think Jim Williams in, in Louisiana is going to work this as well, right? He's, uh, we got we to find some way to help uh, calm the storm prior to the storm, right? I don't know what the answer is. There's humans involved, so anything can happen, right? Um, right. Well, um, I think we've come, Laura, to, um, oh, I, one other thing. I just, I, I think you shared the story, uh, but when did you test this? I know you you, you used it in um, uh, Ida, but did you test this a couple of times prior to Ida, Sherry? Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. Started. I, I, I don't started. even recall the, the very first one we, because we've had it available for years. Um, and like I said, every, every, especially hurricane, um, we put the information out there that this is available. And I think Tom, the first time we got a lot of response on that was when all hazards consortium also put out the information. And I think that was probably three or four years ago, maybe. Does that sound right? Really? I didn't, I didn't. Okay. okay. Yep. I didn't <laughs> you didn't know that, but yes, yes. Yep. And um, I know you have put it out since, you know, basically with every storm, you, you guys put out something um, to, to the most appropriate people that would need that information. Um, so yeah, that's. And, uh, yes. uh, another component of that too is um, how, how does the federal government help or hinder the problem? I mean, a lot of people don't understand the federal government's got a huge responsibility and they're never going to sit still. If there's a disaster, they're going to move. Now they might move in the wrong direction, according to you or me or whatever like that, but they're, going, they're not going to sit still. So I was curious, you've done a lot of work on this. I know with DOT and do we like that. How, 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 how have they evolved to kind of help the process and, and maybe what, what was hindering that now has gotten better? Maybe is, is the way it's it gotten so much better from my understanding of, you know, again, I've been working this since 2012, um, but my colleague here, Mark Morgan, he has been working it even longer. And things have just, the communication between government and industry has become very, very good. And it's consistent and constant, uh, especially during disasters. And we have daily calls. We have daily calls with DOE. We have daily calls with Department of Transportation, you know, with the uh, FEMA. Um, and beyond that, we also have constant email and conversations, just constant communication during a storm. Um, and, and we also get information about waiver requests to them if, if we have, if we know of any reason that there should be any waivers. And of course, then they look into it and, you know, they work their, their, their side of it and make a right. determination. But, but um, again, the communication, is so critical and it has it is so good now so I, I can't say that strongly enough but yeah. it's it's a very good thing I, I know the feds take a lot of criticism you know they're big and it's like that but I, I I know a lot of people at a lot of different ages these are smart people that want to help right very smart uh, yeah, it's, so just, it's, yeah. it's great to see the guys and gals connect mm -hmm. like, like what you've done right and streamline it um mm -hmm. And I'll start naming names, but I don't want to do that. But I know I know a lot I of them. Know, they, yeah. They, they've so been a tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. They've been tremendous partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. quietly, they have their own frustrations with their agencies, right? Quietly. They've never said that in public, but I know they're they're trying to make it better too, right? So um, 
Very good. So if, if I wanted to learn more about this, is there a place I can go uh, currently or in the future that would give me a little? Absolutely. You can call me, at, um, Sherry, at 703-472-7980. Or you can email me at S Stone, so S S T O N E at E M America dot org. Okay, uh, fantastic. Okay. So, Sherry, if I can ask you just to, if you would type that in the chat, right? And Laura, oh, yeah, sure. Laura, I think we can open up. We can open up for Q and A. Um, yeah, we we do have a good question in in the Q&A and I'll just, I'll just read it out to make it easy. Um, this is for Sherry. Does your, does your company or, you know, do your members conduct an all hazards business continuity analysis uh, to address issues that could, could arise in fuel delivery? That's an individual um, company by company. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. The, the the, the individual businesses do that. Yes, they do. Well, I'll, I'll follow up for this person. Do um, I'm assuming the answer to this is yes, but um, do, do you, from your um, from your trade association perch and your and your long long time experience, do you provide guidance? Uh, you know, if a company is new to that thought process or they want to improve their all hazards business continuity analysis? Um, yes, if, if we're asked any questions at all, we definitely do. And a number of the state associations have their own like model and plan. And so ordinarily the businesses would first work with their state association, but beyond that, if there's anything more that's needed, they would come to, to EMA, to, to us at EMA, yes. Great. So they have multiple resources in other words. Excellent. Okay. And, Audience, and, go and ahead. Sherry, I had, a, I had a question. How are the states, from a fuel perspective, how are the states working together, right? Is, is that improving? You know, one, one of the big criticisms that we see all the time is that all the states don't have a uniform process for what we need. Well, that's pretty much every sector. I mean, there's some, like transportation is pretty good, right? They do really well. Homeland Security, sometimes it depends on the issue. Uh, and then there's regions. I mean, there's no, there's no perfect world with dealing with states. And I was curious from your perspective, are the states better coordinating on fuel shortage issues like that? I, I know um, there's a lot of factors to that. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy question nor is it an easy answer, but I just want to get. Yes, absolutely, Tom. From what I've seen, and a lot of that is thanks to, again, to All Hazards Consortium and the, and the work that you've done as far as putting together um, these groups that you have, the, uh, the cross-sector groups where you have the different, some of the different state association or state managers, um, emergency response managers with uh, private industry. And we all talk about how we respond to, to disasters. And it's been extremely helpful. And I think it's been helpful on a state by state level, like state to state, um, in addition to state to industry. It's just allowing us all to understand how the other entity uh, processes what's happening and processes the information and then responds. And it's been extremely helpful and it's gone a long way in helping to have maybe not consensus in the sense that everyone's doing the same thing, but at least understanding and knowledge. So thank you. <laughs> um, another question I had is where do you currently, and this can always change with weather, where do you see most of the fuel shortage issues uh, physically, right? Is it the hurricane belt? Is it, well, you know, I don't, I don't even know if there's fuel, I'm sure there are a fuel issues, wildfires, things like that. Where do you see, most? The, what areas do you see these happen most often um, from your perspective? It's not well, the whole country. Much, months, right? right. It's not so much a, a fuel supply shortage, but distribution problems that we have uh, primarily in the Southeast during hurricane season. Right. which is almost half a year now. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's, um, that's the biggest area that we see the most disasters that are very meaningful and that do impact short-term fuel supply. And of course, I would, you know, would be a shame for me not to mention the impact that the driver shortage is having on all of this. It's having an 
um, huge impact on the supply chain on um, uh, in general, but then during a disaster, it becomes even more problematic. How, I don't know if you have any metrics, how has that affected you guys, the driver shortage issue? And I know it's not a one and done thing. It's a kind of an ongoing thing, right? It's ongoing. It's been for years and it's just been getting worse and worse. And then the pandemic, it really accelerated because, um, you know, you had so many people that had to delay getting their license and license, uh, their CDLs and their hazmat endorsements. Um, because you know we had the, so many so many closures that people couldn't get to do that, right. um, and you already had a shortage. So, and then you have people who are sick. It, they're just hmm. n- there are numerous reasons for the shortage. Um, I from one estimate I read, and you know, and I don't know how accurate this is, but I mean, how I'm sure there's a range of estimates, but the the one that I've seen that seems the most reliable would is about sixty thousand drivers are needed. You know? Wow! And are, are the feds doing anything to help with that, or thinking about that, researching that? What What do you see as the? I know DOE was doing a, a study, um, and there's also yeah. this uh, Drive Safe, this pilot program that's just now been uh, put into law that will help with the commercial driver's license uh, drivers. So that will allow some people at the age of 18 to drive. It will not help with fuel haulers because you have to have your hazmat endorsement and you can only be 21 to get that. But it will put more people into the, into the pool of drivers who may, and some of those may later you know, switch over. Um, we have a number of recommendations for the government and, um, uh, you know, we've we've been we've been relaying that to them as well. So, okay, never ending, never ending, never ending. <laughs> no. Well, um, hey, I, Tom. Yeah, Laura. Tom, we got five more minutes. So, um, I did see one more question come through the chat or the Q and A, which okay. is Q and A is where our audience should put their questions. Um, from, uh, this got asked to a, a previous panel, but um, if you had um, if you had a magic wand and you could improve how government and industry work together to pre-position resources, um, mm-hmm. what, what's something that would help your industry, Sherry, hmm. for pre-positioning resources? Again, the hour Hours of service waiver is so critical and especially days out. I think I would probably have to say that as far as pre-positioning because, Mm -hmm. you know, we just want to be as saturated and as completely filled as we can be before the storm hits so that everyone that needs to evacuate can evacuate. Anyone that just needs to have their car filled up beforehand, you know, that all of that it can happen so that when the storm hits or when we start recovery after the storm is you know goes away then we're we're not already at zero right or we're not already behind which is really the biggest problem so and by, and, i'm sorry go ahead no yeah, I, so pre-positioning it, it it my understanding of it is there's an announcement everybody panics they suck all the fuel out of the ground and they head out of town so we're beginning from, I'm exaggerating, of course, we're right. beginning, we're beginning with empty tanks, right? Right. So right. From your, from yeah. your side, repositioning yeah. is getting 10,000 gallon, you know, things in position ready to refill the retail, right? Mostly retail or mm-hmm. commercial tanks quickly. Or it's also just to keep the retail constantly full. So if you keep retail constantly full before the storm hits, then everybody gets the fuel they need. And then okay. afterwards, most people already have their fuel. They may not be able to go anywhere right away, but at least they have fuel. Um, and then when they can start getting to the stations, you know, at that point, if you have been able to keep everyone filled the whole time, you should at least start with a, a filled underground tank. Got it. So. Okay. That's great. That's great. Still learning. Right. Yeah. Very, very, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. Thank I mean, you. I can talk about you and I've talked about this for hours. So, I mean, I always learn. I love to learn stuff like that. So, uh, okay, Laura, I'm going to just turn it back over to you and uh, we can get ready for the next panel. All right. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.